Ecology or Catastrophe, The Life of Murray Bookchin, by Janet Beale, published by Oxford University Press, 2015. Chapter 11, Green Politico The news in March 1983 was head-spinning, in West Germany in federal elections, a group dedicated to ecological politics had garnered enough votes to gain seats in the Bundestag. They arrived on the first day of the new parliamentary session wearing colorful clothing, carrying planet Earth beach balls and placards on peace and ecology and dragging felled pine trees, withered from acid rain. They refused to call themselves a party, they announced that they were merely the political arm of the huge extra-parliamentary ecology and anti-nuclear movement that had been bringing Germans into the streets for over a decade. Bookchin and his friends and students in Burlington read the news reports and rubbed their eyes in disbelief. In the fall of 1977, it seems, the German anti-nuclear movement had reached an impasse. The government had cracked down severely on all oppositional groups, it had met attempted nuclear site occupations, for example with brutality. The movement was being killed by a state arm to the teeth, recalled the journalist and activist Yoda did Firth. Activists debated what to do next. Some advocated going the parliamentary route, entering local and provincial legislatures on platforms calling for no nukes, wildlife conservation and greater local self-government. It would mean participating in the hated power party system, but it might be worth it if they could change some laws. We had to find a political space where we could continue to work, said Did Firth. Because of the crackdown, there weren't many choices. Political ecologists began running for seats in provincial legislatures. They didn't define themselves ideologically, after all, pollution, acid rain, and nuclear radiation affected everyone. They got a few votes but not enough to gain seats. In Frankfurt, local radicals met in July 1978 at the home of Ditfirth and her partner, Manfred Zeran, and some of us in the non-dogmatic left decided, after long hard discussions, to risk working in Parliament. True, the mainstream political process might end up neutralizing their radical goals, and some of our friends warned us about the mechanisms of integration. But we hoped for new political possibilities, like the creation of a radical democratic milieu. They formed the Hessian Green List, to run for seats in the Hessian Landtag, or provincial legislature. In December 1979 the NATO Euromissile announcement fueled the activists' new program of running candidates. In January 1980 a thousand political ecologists met in Karlsruhe and officially united as the Greens, Die Grünen. They were environmentalists, anti-nuclear activists, squatters, radical feminists, Christian pacifists, punks, anthroposophists, and leftists, notably the Hessian Green List and some eco-socialists from Hamburg and West Berlin. Many of these Greens, not just the leftists, were familiar with social ecology, Bookchin's books were available in German translation, and took for granted the inseparability of social and ecological questions. The Congress chose to advance, not an ideology but four pillars, ecology social justice, grassroots democracy, and nonviolence. Right-wingers were also present at the Greens' founding Congress in Karlsruhe, like Herbert Gruhl, author of a 1975 bestseller called A Planet is Plundered, which argued that an ecological dictatorship was necessary to coerce people to reduce their consumption of natural resources. Even some pro-Nazi groups were interested in joining. Some advocated putting aside old political differences, in the name of saving the planetary biosphere, Rudolf Barrow, an East German dissident who had made his way to the West, called on the Greens to welcome the whole political spectrum, from eco-socialists to Gruel. Two months after Karlsruhe, the Greens adopted a basic program, laying out an array of progressive social and economic demands, even invoking the potentialities of modern society for utopia. The right-wingers and neo-Nazis couldn't tolerate it and departed. The leftists rightfully prided themselves on having prevented ecology from becoming a radical right or even neo-fascist issue. Thereafter peace activists, feminists, socialists, and conservationists flocked into the Greens. It was a movement of alternative people against bureaucrats, of the grassroots against the repressive state, 
of visionaries against functionaries. In the next few years the Greens would portray themselves as transcending political divisions, being beyond left and right, their popular slogan was we are neither right nor left but up front. But their program of 1980 was truly radical left, and distinctly social ecological. Distrust of parliamentary politics ran deep among the West German Greens. Once Green representatives entered a legislature, everyone knew, they risked becoming professional politicians. Even the most idealistic person could become a compromising deal-maker, it was the nature of the system. But they considered themselves principled and their opposition to nuclear weapons and environmental destruction as non-negotiable, the very future of the planet depended on their ability to maintain this position unwaveringly, in the face of all challenges and temptations. So the Greens developed a set of rules to keep future office holders accountable to the grassroots and thereby bound to principle. Green policy decisions would be made only by rank and file members, in local and provincial assemblies or congresses. Any Green legislators would be required to advance these policies, imperative mandate. No Green legislator could at the same time also hold a party position, separation of mandate and office. After two years, Green legislators would have to give up their seats to other Greens, rotation. Green legislators and party officials would have to be 50% women, gender parity. And Green legislators had to turn over most of their salaries to the party for projects and initiatives. These democratic procedures were essential to the Greens' political self-definition. To distinguish themselves from conventional parties, they didn't even call themselves the Green Party just the Greens. One spokesperson, Petra Kelly, called them an anti-party party. In March 1981 the Hessian Green List in Frankfurt won more than 5% of the vote, enough to gain seats in the city council. The six councillors who arrived at City Hall that first day, did Firth was one, wore gas masks and smocks and carried a sign that read Green Anti-Catastrophe Service, Parliamentary and Extra-Parliamentary. The other councillors, appalled, wouldn't let them in. We stood before the city hall doors, which were barricaded from inside, recalled Did Firth. But finally those inside had to admit them. Even as elected councillors, the six considered themselves merely an extension of the extra-parliamentary movements. We made spectacular opposition politics in the city hall and beyond, recalled Did Firth. We demonstrated in the streets against air and water pollution. We organized mass assemblies against Start Bonn West the airport runway extension and against the nuclear installations in Bibli and Hanau. We forced debates on toxic wastes from Hoogst. Meanwhile they tried to expose the city council's failings, to make local citizens aware of the inadequacies of representative democracy. One day, they hoped, the citizens would no longer allow themselves to be administered, but rather increasingly represent their interests themselves. In March 1983, turbocharged by the peace movement, Greens all over West Germany entered the federal elections, demanding a shutdown of nuclear power plants and the scrapping of the Euro missiles. On election day, they surprised even themselves by garnering enough votes to earn 27 seats in the Bundestag. Newspapers all over the world, including those in Vermont, ran stories about their eye-popping entry into the Bundestag with dead tree branches. In Vermont, Bookchin and his companeros watched closely as the German Greens went on to advance ecology feminism, and disarmament in the Bundestag. Especially in contrast to the dismal, Reagan-dominated American scene, recalled Brian Toker, the visionary policies and electoral victories of Die Grünen in Germany appeared to be nothing short of a political miracle. Bookchin knew well, from the experience with the MCM in Montreal, that a party's political success can attract opportunists who wish to lead it away from the movement that spawned it. Even in Burlington, Bernard Sanders seemed to be turning into a conventional politician. But street demonstrations and human chains were no option either, they were fleeting, transient, as Murray had pointed out in spring offensives in 1971. A movement had to enter the political sphere if it wished to make lasting change. It was a dilemma but libertarian municipalism, Bookchin thought, would solve it. 
a movement could enter the electoral arena and gain power, and by renouncing power in favor of permanent citizens' assemblies, it could resist becoming normalized. The German Greens were fascinating because they were grappling with the same Silla and Charybdis problem in their own way, demonstrations expressed popular opposition but were impermanent, but traditional parties led to bureaucracy following the iron law of oligarchy. With their remarkable structures of accountability the Greens seemed to have found their own third way, to have transcended the dilemma. Their political focus, like Murray's, was primarily local, they were attempting to create popular power by entering municipal politics. But if they were to stay grassroots democratic, Bookchin thought, the Greens would need to call not merely for environmental reforms but for a devolution of power to citizens' assemblies in each of those places. He could teach them how to do it. So leaderizing with the Germans, Bookchin and his companeros renamed themselves the Burlington Greens. In the summer of 1983, one of the Germans' founding members actually visited Burlington, Rudolf Barrow, the former East German dissident, who now called himself a social ecologist. He was just passing through, he had come to the United States to visit the ashram of Bhagavan Sri Rajneesh in Oregon. When Barrow arrived in Burlington, all dressed in red, the Rajanishi's color, it freaked us out. Still, they admired Barrow and mined him for information about the German Greens. In October 1983 Bookchin and Barrow lectured at Dartmouth College to some 150 people on building a green movement in the United States. The German Greens, Bookchin said, were attempting to create a new politics that was decentralized, ecological, and ethical. Whether that attempt would be successful we have yet to ascertain. The Greens might very well go the way of the now conventional MCM. To avoid that fate, they would need sophisticated consciousness, a libertarian focus, and intense commitment. Meanwhile in the United States, we can learn as much from their errors as from their successes. For a green network we certainly require. That fall the German peace movement reached its apogee, in anticipation of the Bundestag's upcoming vote on whether to allow the deployment of the Pershing II and cruise missiles. On October 22 a million and a half Germans demonstrated against deployment. Peace vigils and fasts, peace marches, caravans, and sit-ins surrounded missile sites and military bases, one protest followed another. As promised, the German Greens kept themselves anchored in the peace movement. Then, on November 22, the Bundestag voted on deployment. The 27 Green parliamentarians were among the 226 who voted no, but 286 voted in favor. With breathtaking speed, only a few weeks later, the missiles were in place. The Greens, the peace movement's parliamentary arm, had failed. Entering politics had produced nothing. Defeat hung in the air. What should the idealistic German Greens do now? By this time, Black Rose Books was publishing whatever book Chin wrote and even giving his earlier, out-of-print works new editions. I put my heart and soul into it because I really believed in the ideas, Rousseau Polos told me. The feeling was mutual, Murray's collaboration with Dimitri was a source of great support, both personally and politically, for nearly two decades. Whenever Bookchin visited Montreal, he stayed at Dimitri and Lucia's Greystone Row House in the Milton Park housing cooperative that they had helped organize. Rousseau Polas agreed with Bookchin that libertarian municipalism, a form of anarchism, was the most convincing form of radical politics. Both felt that anarchism generally was mired in its past, too focused on the 19th century a veritable mausoleum. Anarchists main political tool, direct action, was about protest, not about building lasting forms of freedom. In order to become meaningful for the late 20th century anarchism had to overcome its aversion to political participation. Libertarian municipalism offered them the way to do that, it was a non-hierarchical, democratic politics for citizen empowerment. They were sure that anarchists would recognize the value of the idea and go for it. It shouldn't be a great leap for them. After all, communal empowerment had once been part of the anarchist tradition. The canonical 19th century thinkers, 
especially after the 1871 Paris Commune, had all supported a communalist strain of anarchism that encompassed a sense of civic virtue and commitment. Proudhon had said that local communes and associations should group together in confederations in which the delegates of townships would have authority. Bakunin had said that after the revolution the basic unit of all political organization would have to be the completely autonomous commune. These communes would form federations of autonomous communes at the provincial level, they would then federate nationally and internationally, replacing the nation-state. Kropotkin had agreed that in the post-revolutionary order, independent communes, towns and villages would break down the state and substitute free federation for parliamentary rule. Later anarchists had taken other routes, eclipsing this municipalism in favor of anarcho-syndicalism, but now that times had changed, the working class had proved to be non-revolutionary, the age of ecology was at hand, and new social movements were on the rise Bookchin and Rousseau Polos wanted to revive that old tradition of the revolutionary commune. Libertarian municipalism, as a new iteration of anarcho-communalism, expressed that revival. In the next years, puzzled anarchists would query Murray about his new program. So, Murray, they would ask, as Canadian anarchist Ron Haley did in 1985, are you saying that anarchists should run for city governments? I'm saying, Bookchin would reply that city government, as you call it, has to be restructured at the grassroots level. But how? Was the common objection. Bookchin would answer, by creating citizens' assemblies. We did it in Burlington by using grassroots pressure, and the city council did create them, but then once they were in place, the mayor's office neutralized their radical potential. What does the logic of that dilemma tell you? It tells you that we eco-anarchists, or anarcho-communalists, have to run for office and take power ourselves so that at that moment they won't do what Burlington's mayor did. They will instead choose to devolve power to the neighborhoods and vest it structurally in those citizens' assemblies. But Murray, Haley objected, hasn't city government become really statified in the last 10 years? Or as others would later phrase it, weren't municipal governments actually just miniature nation-states, and city councils miniature parliaments? To which Book Chin would reply by distinguishing between politics and statecraft. Statecraft included parliamentarism and hierarchy and domination and all the associated trade-offs and deal-making that he despised just as much as any anarchist, Statecraft was endemic to state, provincial, and national governments. But the local level, the neighborhood, and community level, was qualitatively different, it was the realm of politics, where community self-management was possible, when I use the word politics, I go back to the original Hellenic meaning of an active citizen body managing its own affairs. Politics need not degenerate into statecraft if it is confined to the civic level and also if it is consciously posed against the state. For once the grassroots democracy was created, it would municipalize the economy confederate with other such assemblies of eco-communities, and thereby form an alternative or dual power to counteract the centralization of power. But Murray, was the invariable rejoinder, how can you hope to achieve this goal by participating in electoral politics? Lots of well-intentioned radicals have thought they could change the system that way, but the same thing happens every time, the system changes them, and they become part of the problem. Wouldn't that happen to anarchist city councillors, too? Of course Bookchin admitted, like anyone else anarchist councillors could be co-opted. But we are all too aware of that sorry history now, aware of how that kind of absorption into the system has historically torpedoed previous radical movements. Future anarchist councillors could prevent themselves from being co-opted by studying the whole problem, and developing a sophisticated understanding. So when the time came for them to make the fateful choice, they would do so not naively but with an acute consciousness of what was at stake, that the very preservation of the biosphere depended on the choice that they and others, in other liberated municipalities, would make. And so they would choose with moral probity. There was no substitute, Bookchin often said, for consciousness, for a conscious reconstruction of our relationship to each other and the natural world. Persuading anarchists, Bookchin began to realize, 
might prove to be a challenge after all, a rejection of politics was deeply ingrained not only in their ideology but in their political identity. But he was confident of his powers of persuasion, and that the historical logic of this approach would bear him out. After all, did anarchists really want to remain irrelevant to the course of events? Did they want their ideology to remain a museum piece? As Rousseau Polos mused years later, if you want to take over cities but you don't want to run in elections, then what are you going to do? Storm City Hall with rifles. One day in the early 1980s, Murray was in Dimitri's study, leafing through Sam Dolgoff's anthology of Bakunin's writings, he had helped Dolgoff get it published long ago, when he came across a passage that made him gasp and shout. Dimitri rushed in. Murray pointed to a passage where Bakunin said that municipal politics was qualitatively different from politics at the provincial and national levels, the people have a healthy practical common sense when it comes to communal affairs. They are fairly well informed and know how to select from their midst the most capable officials. Under such circumstances, effective control is quite possible because the public business is conducted under the watchful eyes of the citizens and vitally and directly concerns their daily lives. This is why municipal elections always best reflect the real attitude and will of the people. Provincial and county governments, even when the latter are directly elected, are already less representative of the people. In other words, the hallowed anarchist forefather had considered the municipality to be a valid terrain of anarchist activity. What greater legacy could an anarchist call upon than Bakunin? Bookchin exulted. The passage established the anarchist legitimacy of libertarian municipalism, Rousseau Polos told me. It was no longer his invention, it had a pedigree. Rousseau Polos was encouraging anarchist publishers in Europe to translate Bookchin's work, Antistato in Italy, Atelier Creation Libertaire in France, Diethnus Bibliothèque in Greece, and Trotsdam Verlag in West Germany. As a result, European anarchists were becoming curious about this new politics, and Rousseau Polos and Bookchin were eager to explain it. To give them a venue, the Europeans organized an international anarchist gathering that would create a new anarchism. The Encontro, as it was known, opened in Venice on September 24, 1984. Ciao. Anarchisi, read the banner under which more than 3,000 Campaneros streamed during the week, young and old, anarcho-syndicalists and punks, straight and gay, from as far away as Malaysia and New Zealand. 200 German and Swiss autonomous youth arrived, with iridescent chopped hair, many of them squatters. They were a bit wild and woolly, complained the aging English anarcho-syndicalist Albert Meltzer, who preferred to fraternize with the aging CNT veteran Luis Edo. They spoke a babble of languages, but when they couldn't comprehend each other's words, they gestured and danced. Buchan's speech was eagerly anticipated. He took the podium, in dark green work clothes, a row of mechanical pencils arrayed in the breast pocket, as always, and launched into it. Capitalism is simplifying the planet, he told them. It is commodifying both people and the natural world. The historical subject is not the worker but the citizen. The feminist, ecology, and community movements must create decentralized human communities, tailored to their ecosystems. They must democratize towns and cities and confederate them, and create a dual power against the state. When he mentioned that anarchists should run in elections, the old Sinatista Edo let out a shocked cry, Murray. But most suspended judgment out of respect, listening closely. After the plenary sessions, Bookchin continued talking about it to the Campaneros as they walked along Venice's canals and Campi, well into the night. Bob D'Attilio recalled that Murray was a remarkable presence in addressing a group, crowd, street gatherings. I think he amazed the comrades with his passion, his spontaneity his energy. They loved him. Murray was outstanding, Rousseau Polos recalled. At every occasion he would engage in long discussions and debates. One afternoon while talking to a group of 20 or 30 anarcho-syndicalists in a piazza, Bookchin explained the distinction between workplace and community between worker and citizen. There was a lot of hesitation, 
Diatilio told me, perhaps yes, perhaps no. Bookchin repeated that anarchists should run in municipal elections, when an old Senatista woman stood up, she had been among the Spanish exiles in France. We voted in municipal elections, she beamed, smiling broadly. Later, Luis Edo made his way over to Murray and embraced him and kissed him. That's the kind of situation that he created, Rousseau Polas said. Some German anarcho-punks complained to Albert Meltzer, the old-school anarcho-syndicalist, that the translators were doing a poor job. It almost sounded as if they were talking of a political party to fight elections on a green basis, they said in disgust. I had to tell them, Meltzer said, that their understanding and the translations were perfect and what was inadequate was the discrimination of the organizers. But Bookchin paid no attention to such grousing and buttonholed some of the older German anarchists, urging them to get involved with the German Greens and bring this new politics with them, the Greens needed it badly. All in all, Bookchin found the Venice Incontro a rare gathering committed to searching discussion. The Italian publisher Paolo Finza told me in retrospect that it was a magic moment. Bookchin represented a sound anchorage with anarchist tradition and at the same time tried to explore new realms of thought and action. Murray was a living patrimony for a movement that long had a too narrow relationship to its own great ideas. As a coming out party for libertarian municipalism, it was promising. Afterward, Bookchin traveled around Italy for a few weeks, speaking in small cities and towns where he'd been invited. In Carrara, one of the older anarchists told him a fascinating story. Starting in the 1880s, anarcho-syndicalists had dominated politics in the town. They had led strikes and introduced the six-hour workday, and were immensely popular. From 1945 until the 1960s, Carrara was all but in their hands, if they had chosen to run for office, they could have had a majority on the city council. But the anarchists did not run for office. Instead, the communists and socialists did, and now, in 1984, those parties controlled Carrara. Walls around town bore the hammer and sickle, the Union of Marble Workers, once anarchist, was now part of the Communist Labor Federation. The anarchists were reduced to a handful of elderly people in a broken-down reading room. What had happened? The problem, this man told Book Chin, was that the anarchists were absolute political abstentionists. They regarded even voting, let alone running for office, as blasphemy. The communists had easily moved into the political vacuum, and occupied it. In late October, Book Chin took a train up to Frankfurt to catch up with the Greens, on whom he now pinned great, even revolutionary hopes. Around the time of Venezia, Rousseau Polas told me, he was getting much more involved with the Germans, almost obsessive. He was a passionate Germanophile. Like Lenin and the Bolsheviks, he thought Germany was the key to the future. How would the Greens move forward, now that they had lost the struggle against the Euro missiles? Bookchin found Yoda Ditfirth to be a kindred spirit, she was a charismatic speaker, as he was, driven by a ferocious commitment to upholding a principled revolutionary politics, given to quoting Rosa Luxemburg, militant and tenacious, yet also charming, warm, and infectious in spirit. She and her allies were Buchin's great hope within the Greens. In her Frankfurt apartment, Yuta explained to Murray the recent developments. You have to go back to the Hessian Landtag elections of September 1982, she might have said. Neither of the two major parties in Hesse got enough votes to form a government on their own. The Greens got 8%. The Social Democrats, SPD, realized that if they could persuade the Greens to ally with them, they could form a red-green governing coalition. When they proposed it, the Greens of course said no. Such a coalition was inconceivable to them, it was incompatible with their self-identity as the principled anti-party party of fundamental opposition and they loathed the SPD as unprincipled deal-makers. The day after that Hessian election, a local taxi driver named Jishka Fischer was thinking about the situation and got the idea that a red-green coalition would really not be such a bad thing, especially if the Greens could negotiate good terms. 
Up to that point, Fisher and his anarchist, Sponti, friends had not been Green members, but now they paid their dues and signed up. They created a realpolitik working group to urge the Greens to, well, get real. Fundamental opposition was the babblings of yesterday, they said, and a fundamental transformation of society was unobtainable. Those who pretended otherwise were pseudo-radical purists, fundamentalists, or fundies. Fisher and his friends won over several hundred Hessian Greens to their point of view, and in January 1983 a provincial assembly elected him to the Hessian list. Then, on March 6, 1983, Fisher had been one of the 27 Greens to enter the Bundestag in that colorful parade. In the next provincial election in Hesse, in late 1983, did Firth continued, the Greens' vote fell to 5.9%. They still had enough to qualify for seats in the land tag, but the percentage was less than before. Fisher and his fellow Realpolitikers blamed the fundies for the setback. See. He said. Voters don't want fundamental opposition. So shaken were the Hessian Greens that their grip on the reins of leadership loosened. Fisher easily took those reins for himself. That was when the local Social Democrats came knocking. Rule Hesse with us, they appealed to him, in a red-green coalition. My green base won't approve it, he surely replied. Okay then, said the SPD, suppose you Greens don't form a coalition with us, but you do agree to sit back and tolerate our SPD government. You wouldn't have to join a ruling coalition. You just have to say you tolerate its budget. How about it, Fisher? Fisher replied, to get my green base to agree to that, you'd have to shut down Hesse's two nuclear power plants and cancel the Frankfurt Airport runway extension. No, they said. We agree to build no more new nuclear plants, but that's all. And we'll accept some of your green policies on energy and forests. Fisher took this proposed toleration agreement to a Hessian Green Congress and recommended to the assembled movement activists that they should approve it. Symbolic gestures he told them, like human chains and peace marches, change nothing. It's legislators, not demonstrators, who make policy. To get at least part of what you want from your adversaries, you have to negotiate. Politics is the art of compromise. It's really just horse trading. The Frankfurt radicals, they rejected the name Fundi, were appalled and fired back. Fisher is asking you, they told the Congress, to tolerate the continued operation of the two nuclear power plants. That's unacceptable. These people are sellouts, power-hungry opportunists, wheeling and dealing. We Greens have to stick to our original goal, fundamental social change. The Hessian Greens listened to both sides. Then they voted to tolerate the SPD minority government. And here we are, Yuda might have said to Murray in October 1984. The Greens are in a ruling coalition with the SPD in Hesse. Fisher and his buddies are trying to normalize the Greens so that they become just another party in a corrupt system careening toward ecological disaster. But from the start we have been about fundamental opposition, about grassroots democracy and ecology and peace and social justice. We are about creating a sane future. My friends and I are still committed to that, to the movements from which the Greens sprang, and that's what we'll fight for. Book Chin would fight for it, too. In late October he spoke in Hamburg, West Berlin, and Hanover, accompanied by his friend and translator Karl Ludwig Skibble. Among Greens, he met with realists as well as radicals, arguing against the toleration agreement, by which the Greens would surrender their very identity. But then, the Greens should not have entered into the legislatures in the first place, he said, a parliamentary party will always demoralize and vitiate the extra-parliamentary movement that gave rise to it. What the Greens should do is abandon provincial and federal politics and create citizens' assemblies at the neighborhood level. And when he met with German anarchists, it was to importune them to join the Greens and work with the radicals to strengthen the wing that was committed to fundamental opposition. As always, his appearances were followed by late-night discussions in cafes. 
he savored Germany's feisty radical scene and the verve and imagination of its alternative communities. He admired the Greens' spontaneity and fervor, the sparkling brilliance of their speakers, and above all the wide range of social, political, and moral issues with which they deal. The great debate was creative, he thought. He scrutinized every development in Green politics, because the soul of the movement hangs excitingly on whether the Greens moved to the left or made compromises with the establishment. He shared a platform with Ditfirth in Castle on October 31st and praised her principled commitment to fundamental opposition. He also lauded the Hamburg eco-socialists Thomas Eberman and Rainer Trampert, who had evolved from Marxists to eco-socialists. They weren't just putting a green coat over a red identity, they've largely abandoned all their Leninist principles, and have moved in a highly libertarian direction. That has been terribly encouraging. The leftist Greens, as individuals, possessed an exhilaratingly high level of theoretical understanding, he thought, and their intense idealism gave them the power of endurance. Not since the 1930s had he witnessed political actors so ready to undertake the laborious, protracted, thankless work of implementing social change. They weren't merely expressing themselves, they were ready to take responsibility, in ways that their parents' generation had not. They were adults. By comparison, Americans, as political actors, seemed erratic, plagued by an appetite for episodic highs and kicks. They entered and left movements as though they were skating through shopping malls. When he got back to the United States, he resolved, he would not drop his standards to accommodate their immaturity. Still, the American eco-activists had a great advantage, they had the country's utopian traditions at their backs, its town meetings, its mistrust of the federal government, and its respect for individual rights. Germans, he suggested, could learn from those libertarian traditions, while Americans could learn from Germans' theoretical rigor. If they could ever somehow join forces, the resulting movement would be a formidable force. He was eager to share his philosophical ideas with the German green intellectuals, especially his solution to the Frankfurt School's dilemma about reason and ethics. In a lecture at Goethe University the original home of the Frankfurt School, he explained that one could ground ethics ontologically in nature without raising the specter of social Darwinism, he told his listeners about the evolutionary continuum between nature and society its gradations and phases and mediations, and the organic unfolding of latent potentialities for freedom and consciousness. Whether his audience understood that he was trying to answer the Horkheimer Adorno dilemma, or were even aware of it, is unrecorded. A few days after Bookchin left Germany in November 1984, the Hessian economics minister, an SPD member, approved the construction of a new plutonium processing plant near Frankfurt. That was more than even Jishka Fischer and his relos could stomach. On November 19 the Greens withdrew from the toleration agreement, and the SPD's provincial government in Hesse collapsed. Now the radicals had a chance to put the party back on course. In December a Green Congress elected Ditfirth as one of three speakers of the Bulletinvio, Bundesverstand, the party executive at the federal level. From that high-profile position, she could speak for fundamental opposition. Across the Atlantic, the Reagan administration's anti-environmental policies made urgent the formation of an American Green movement. In May 1984 activists met at the North American Bioregional Congress, in the Ozark foothills of Missouri, and formed a Green Politics Working Group. Later that year, a larger group of people met in St. Paul, Minnesota, to continue the discussions, the ISE organized the meeting. Sixty-two people attended, among them Dan Choderkoff of the ISE and Chino Garcia of Charas, who advanced the position that the U.S. Greens should take a decentralized approach to organizing their movement. They should establish local groups, then feed rate them in regional alliances, through an openly democratic, bottom-up process. But others at St. Paul rejected this message, they preferred to establish a national green organization, even a top-down green party right away. Among them were Charlene Spritnik, author of a book about the German Greens, whom she viewed through a New Age lens. As a compromise the St. Paul gathering established a loose green organization, 
called the Committees of Correspondence, to begin organizing. Book Chin was chagrined by the calls for a national party but the nature of the American electoral system was, ironically a consolation. In the U.S. winner-take-all system, the candidate with the most votes gets elected, period. By contrast, in the German system of proportional representation, a party needed only 5% of the total vote to gain seats. That had catapulted the Greens onto the national level too quickly. The American system, fortunately would shut Greens out until they could win 51%. Americans thus wouldn't have to grapple with the problem of whether to form a conventional party to participate in statecraft, an obstacle that would only be a boon. With parliamentary participation off the table the American Greens could build on the example of the New England town meeting. And Vermont would play a crucial role both as the locus class ecus of the town meeting and as the place that had launched the nuclear freeze issue onto the national landscape. But before Bookchin could engage fully with Vermont, Europe beckoned once again. A year after his previous visit, he returned to Germany, Skibble had translated The Ecology of Freedom, then found a publisher and organized a book tour. When he arrived in October 1985, the intra-party battle for the soul of the Greens had escalated. Did Firth, bold, forthright, and militant, had become the most prominent spokesperson for the radicals, pitted against Fisher, the leader of the Relos. In public debates and at party congresses, each appealed to the base for support on behalf of their respective factions. Unrelentingly the Relos gained ground, by March 1985 they called the shots even in the Frankfurt party. Meanwhile Greens in other parts of Germany were winning seats in legislatures at all levels of government. As Green parliamentarians honed their political skills and cultivated media connections, their ties to the movement loosened, and their caucuses became increasingly independent. The structures of accountability that were intended to prevent normalization were weakening. One high-profile Green, Petra Kelly, refused to yield her seat when party rules required her to rotate, that would disrupt the continuity of experienced personnel, she argued. When Green newcomers were elected to important positions, those who had more experience manipulated and sidelined them. To get around the ban on individuals holding both party and legislative office simultaneously, a small group of green politicians alternated positions among themselves for appearances' sake. These erosions of the democratic structures weakened rank and file control over the parliamentarians. At the Frankfurt Book Fair that October, Bookchin stationed himself at his publisher's display where Die Okologiter Freiheit received considerable attention. But outside in the streets, Frankfurt was in an uproar. Two weeks earlier, on September 28, a 35-year-old anti-fascist, Gunter Seer, had been marching in a demonstration, when a 26-ton water cannon knocked him over with its stream, and then ran over him, killing him. The city's alternative scene convulsed with fury. Black-hooded anarchists ripped into the streets to fight with police. Did Firth denounce Seer's killing as a police state in action? Just at that moment, Hesse was holding yet another provincial election, once again, as in 1983, no single party gained the necessary majority, and once again Greens gained enough seats to make the difference. This time, the SPD wanted the Greens to agree to a real governing coalition, not merely a toleration. The two parties negotiated. Holger Borner, the local SPD headman, handed Fischer his party's terms, the Greens must accept the existence of Hesse's two nuclear facilities. Fisher submitted Green demands, in turn, but Borner rejected them. Meanwhile the streets were aflame with outrage over Sayre's death. When Fisher and his friend Daniel Cohn-Bendit spoke at a Frankfurt University teach-in, the audience threw eggs at them. Did Firth lambasted the real low Hessian Greens for even considering an agreement with the water cannon deploying, nuclear power plant permitting, airport runway extension supporting SPD. Bookchin had to leave Frankfurt for the book tour, but he and Dit Firth agreed to meet up at a later point. Skibble had organized a weekend seminar in a town outside Hamburg on October 11-13. Green intellectuals and politicos from all factions came to hear Murray Bookchin. 
he tried talking to them about nature philosophy and the Frankfurt School but soon saw their eyes glaze over, the only question that could hold their attention was whether the Hessian Greens should agree to that governing coalition with the SPD. Murray begged them to forget about all such parliamentary coalitions. Real politics wasn't about mobilizing for the next election, it was about creating citizens' assemblies in neighborhoods and communities. He sat down with Thomas Eberman, the Hamburg eco-socialist whom he admired as one of the most gifted voices of the socialistic wing of the Greens. What did Eberman think of his municipalist program? He asked. Would the leftist Greens consider that route? Eberman, who was familiar with Murray's ideas, replied by dismissing Murray's basic premise that local politics was somehow closer to the people than provincial or federal, in Germany he said, even local legislators got caught up in machine politics. To which Murray responded that the point of electing people to a city council was not to institute whatever environmental reforms the local economic interests would allow, but to create citizens' assemblies and devolve power to them by changing the city charter. German cities don't have charters, Eberman objected. Then create assemblies outside the power structure, Bookchin said, and insist on structurally empowering them. Demand urban land for green spaces, for ecological programs. Demand housing, control over education, free public transportation, and so on, and escalate these demands into points of friction, of contestation. People will flock to the assemblies you call, and you will be on your way to democratizing the towns. Then confederate those democratized towns and cities and demand power from the provincial government, then from the federal government. As each level demands power from the one above it, then gains it, you will restructure Germany into a popular democracy. But first you need a civic movement to create those neighborhood assemblies. Without such a movement, you'll never go beyond wheeling and dealing in the back rooms of the Bundestag. Eberman replied that Buchin's plan was too idealistic. Municipalities would never cooperate, capitalist society creates competition among them. Finally he dismissed Murray's ideas precisely for being ideas, for being a theory. Theories are part of the problem, he said, and only fearful people need them. We're not waiting for some great person to rescue us with a brilliant idea or the perfect formula. The best ideas will come from the streets, where the real fight goes on. As I listened to the audio tape of this conversation, decades later, while doing research for this book, I thought I heard Murray's heart breaking in the background. He had been so eager and had placed so much hope in these Germans, who he thought shared his love of ideas. Eberman's brush off must have hurt. Still, disciplined agitator that he was, Bookchin continued on his book tour, moving from one city to the next, giving inspiring speeches, sometimes two a day. On October 21st he met up with Did Firth, who surely gave him the terrible news, if he hadn't heard it already, a few days earlier Jishka Fischer had reached a deal with the Hessian SPD to form that governing coalition. The SPD had rejected almost all the green demands, but Fischer had accepted the coalition anyway. He had won only one concession from the Social Democrats, the Greens could name the Minister of Environment and Energy. That is, the Greens could name one of their own to oversee the two nuclear power plants, plus a new plutonium processing plant that was in the works. But the last word lay with the Hessian Green rank and file. They would have to give the proposed coalition agreement a thumbs up or a thumbs down. They would do so at a membership assembly to be held a few days later at New Eisenberg, outside Frankfurt. In the intervening days, Bookchin and Did Firth campaigned together for principle and the grassroots and democratic accountability, they appear jointly at a high school, to a packed auditorium, denouncing the Rilo's opportunism and power grabbing. Parliamentarism corrupts even the best intentioned people he told the audience, and once enmeshed in statecraft, they become an encumbrance on any radical movement. He spoke at Goethe University again, then Heidelberg University and finally on October 27, he reached New Eisenberg. Instead of the usual two or three hundred members who attended these assemblies, more than a thousand Greens packed the hall for this crucial one. Longtime Frankfurt activists turned up in force, 
those who had opposed the airport runway extension since the early 1970s, and those who had fought the construction of nuclear power plants since Will, and even those who had worked on the early citizens' initiatives in the 1970s. But the Rilos, too, turned out, all of Fisher's Frankfurt pals, everyone who wanted a little office for himself was there, recalled Did Firth. Should the Greens accept the coalition with the SPD? Both sides weighed in on the momentous question, alternating fundies and relos at the microphone. When Did Firth's turn came, she said the proposed coalition is not realism, it is the road to integration into the ruling system. Accepting it would actually require the Greens to accept the existence of nuclear power plants. But in truth the only coalition partners for us are the social movements. They are growing, they are ready for us, and today we have a chance to move toward the reconstruction of this industrial society into an ecological, social, and democratic society. Or rather, she tried to say these things, all the while the relos were heckling her, trying to drown her out. The atmosphere was heated to the boiling point, she recalled. Anyone who tried to defend the Green program was shouted down. One of Fisher's old cronies cynically compared those of us who opposed the coalition to members of a Nazi tribunal. And then it came time for the Hessian Greens to vote. As Book Chin watched from the floor, they raised their yellow membership cards to register their choice. By a two-to-one margin, they approved the Red-Green coalition. No longer were the Hessian Greens an extension of a movement, they were now a conventional party. Fisher, true to form, didn't miss a beat, he declared himself a candidate for Minister of Environment and Energy. Book Chin made a final appearance the next day, October 28, with Did Firth, in nearby Ziegen, aching from the painful loss. It's deeply depressing, Did Firth grieved. Instead of throwing sand in the engine, the Greens are spreading a new and better kind of oil. Book Chin listened to her words with immense respect. And surely wondered, if the anarchists had entered the Greens and fought on the Fundi side, could they have made a difference? A few weeks later, on December 12, 1985, Jishka Fischer became Hesse's Minister for Energy and Environment. When he did, the rank-and-file movement-oriented Greens found that they had a dilemma, they could no longer campaign for a shutdown of nuclear power plants. One of their own, after all, was minister in charge of ensuring their continued operation. By then Book Chin had moved on to a Parisian suburb, where some of his Italian and Swiss anarchist friends were gathered for a conference. He spoke to them with his usual passion about municipalism, but in the year since Venice, they had thought it over and reached their verdict. It was not the one Book Chin had been hoping for. The municipality could not possibly be a realm of freedom, they insisted to him. Perhaps it could have become a realm of freedom a century ago, one Campanero said, perhaps, but today's municipalities could not possibly transform themselves into citizens' assemblies. It was out of the question. The nation-state had swallowed the municipality chewed and digested it, and assimilated it into its now seamlessly monolithic structure. Neighborhood power too was over, another asserted, because even neighborhoods belong to history. Nor should we mourn the impossibility of citizens' assemblies, someone interjected, since they perpetuated economic inequality and were therefore potentially regressive. Book Chin found it depressing. Why were they all so eager to spurn libertarian democratic institutions, rather than think out how to create them. Why were they so indifferent to today's anti-hierarchical movements, peace, feminism, ecology? Did a movement have to explicitly label itself as anarchist in order to gain the anarchist seal of approval? The new movements were anarchist in practice, even if they didn't use that precise label, they all expressed an emancipatory moral sensibility and pointed to broad notions of freedom. Most recently the radicals in the German Greens didn't call themselves anarchist, but for the past few years they had deeply explored the whole issue of movement-based democratic accountability. The Fundiria Low fight had been a momentous battle to prevent a grassroots democratic movement from being absorbed into the state. Yet the anarchists had sat on the sidelines. They should have joined the Greens' left libertarian wing, he thought, 
and tried to make it stronger and even more libertarian. But they had not, and now the German battle was lost. Still, green movements elsewhere were full of promise. Anarchists should enter those movements and advocate assembly democracy there, to prevent a repetition of the German fiasco. As he spoke, his listeners were fuming. Finally one companera could hear no more. Anarchists, enter the Greens. She snapped. But we'd lose our identity as anarchists. Murray was flabbergasted. Political labels were a side issue, he said, one could travel many routes to get to a destination. Movements for freedom had a long history, he'd written about them in his books. They weren't necessarily explicitly anarchist, and many of them long antedated anarchist ideology but that didn't disqualify them from being part of a tradition of freedom. Didn't his listeners care about them, or want to build on them? Another anarchist demurred, no traditions of freedom existed, only traditions of domination. Bookching could see it was hopeless. Afterward he reflected that these Europeans, although highly cultivated, were paralyzed by dogma and perhaps even cynicism. Surprisingly they were making him homesick. Americans might be naive and impetuous by comparison, prone to seeking kicks, but they could usually be counted on for a can-do spirit. As he traveled through Britain in the late fall of 1985, he urged anarchists in the peace and ecology movements to get involved with green politics, to a mixed response. Finally in late November, he spoke at the history workshop at Leeds Polytechnic. At a post-conference workshop on anarchism, he opened his heart to his anarchist listeners. I genuinely need to know what you think, he appealed to them. We have movements today that aren't anarchist in name, peace, anti-nuclear, feminist, Native American. But they have anarchist qualities. They reject hierarchy. They want to empower people rather than legislators. How, in your opinion, should anarchists relate to them? Do we check first for an anarchist label, and if it's missing, we stay away? Do we run down our list of anarchist criteria, and if one or two are missing, then we say goodbye? Or do we work with them anyway? How would you have related to the German Greens? He asked. They were based in a huge anti-nuclear, pro-democracy ecology-oriented movement that brought multitudes of people into the streets. De facto anarchists co-founded that movement and co-wrote the Greens program. The green idea of a non-party party had anarchist roots. The radicals, the fundies, stood for democratic accountability and some even thought assembly democracy was a good idea. In the real low fundi fight, these de facto anarchistic greens tried to keep the party from becoming parliamentary and conventional. Was that a fight worth joining? He asked. Most German anarchists didn't solidarize with the fundies, in fact, the black-masked ones in Berlin had seemed to prefer to throw bricks. What would you have done? And what should we do in the United States? He asked further. The German Greens have been inspirational to us. Now in New England, in the name of Greens, we're calling for assemblies and local control and municipal confederations to counteract the nation-state. Should we expect anarchists to solidarize with us? Or will they stay aloof? Judging from the audio tape, the English anarchists present didn't entirely understand the question, and those who did responded no more favorably than the continental anarchists had. Bookchin was ready to go home. If municipalism was going to happen anywhere, it would be in the United States, specifically New England. He was finished trying to promote the town meeting to Europeans. Now he would get to work in Vermont.